Greeting Earthlings, if you follow the channel, you know that we love all things Apollo, and that during our last visit to Steve Gervetson's amazing space collection, we were given the opportunity to take two holy boxes of Apollo electronics to our lab. These are the boxes that brought you voice, data, and live TV from the moon. In the last episode, we were able to get the TV link going over our original Apollo S-band transponder and an original NASA ground test receiver. We did not have an original slow scan black and white TV camera at our disposal, but we tried our luck with a vintage NTSC Vidicon camera. Despite the higher bandwidth demands, it worked very well on the command module S-band link which had more available bandwidth than the lunar module link. Okay. So here we go, we, we have Earth's rise. Live uh, from the moon. Right here, it's live from the moon, except it's it's your t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so we found out that the command module had enough bandwidth to get us recrawled in black and white with regular NTSC TV. So much so that NASA took advantage of it and upgraded the command module to color as early as Apollo 10. They once again used tricks to reduce the bandwidth to a third of regular color TV, which we'll explain in a minute. And so on May 19, 1969, Apollo 10 transmitted to humanity its first live view of Earth from space in color. Apollo 11 had the same color TV in the command module, which gave us the great color pictures of the astronauts on board the CM. But as I explained in the previous episode, the LEM had much less bandwidth available. So Apollo 11's lunar camera was the slow scan black and white, and man's first step on the moon was recorded without color, which fortunately wasn't such a big deal on the very gray moon. That's one small step for man. However, in Apollo 12, the LEM also got upgraded to color TV. But that did not end up so well as Alan Bean inadvertently pointed it to the sun and instantly burned out the sensor. More on this unfortunate incident in a minute. And as we all know, Apollo 13's color camera never made it to the moon. Apollo 14 finally got color TV working on the moon, albeit with limited quality. However, the quality kept improving over the next missions, to the point of having quite good pictures, particularly on Apollo 16 and 17. It now came from the robotic color TV camera mounted on the rover, which NASA could remote control. So you can watch the lunar takeoff of Apollo 17. How cool is that? But how did NASA manage to do this with all the aforementioned LEM bandwidth limitations? They had to use many workarounds, which we'll explain in this video. And then, while we're at it, we will try it for ourselves in our setup. So as we just say, the first problem with upgrading to color had to do with bandwidth limitations. As we explained in the last video, the S-band communication system had two downlinks, the PM downlink using phase modulation and the FM downlink using frequency modulation. Because the command module had a dual traveling wave tube amplifier, it had the luxury to transmit on both the PM and the FM links at the same time. When using the television, voice and data were carried on the PM link, and the entirety of the FM link was allocated to television. However, because of weight limitations, the LEM only had a single tube microwave amplifier, so the PM link had to be turned off when the FM link was up, and TV had to share the bandwidth with voice and data, and it had to fit below the voice and data subcarriers. That severely limited the available bandwidth to a measly 700 kHz, down from about 2 MHz in the command module. Mind you, even in the command module, 2 MHz is still not sufficient for NTSC color, which needs about 6 MHz. So in order to reduce the color bandwidth, NASA had to develop a new proprietary color camera 
using a scheme called sequential color. It consists of reusing a black and white NTSC camera at 30 frames per second, but sending successive images, one for red, one for blue and one for green. This could be done very simply by adding a rotating color wheel in front of the lens. The system uses the exact same bandwidth as regular NTSC black and white TV, which had no problem with the higher bandwidth command module link. However, it has one severe downside. It divides the effective frame rate by 3, so you end up with only 10 full color frames per second. If something moves too fast, you get color fringing artifacts. This is because the different color frames don't overlap while the filter is rotating. You can see the resulting color fringing in much of the original color TV footage, such as this astronaut hammering on a stuck core drill. This is what makes the liftoff footage look like a colored firework too. Westinghouse was again contracted to modify their original black and white camera and was able to adapt it in less than 18 months. It is the big black camera demonstrated by Stan Lebar, its chief engineer. The original black and white camera is the silver one laying on the table. They also added a small monitor which the original black and white camera lacked so the astronauts could frame their shots better. It was adapted from a commercial Japanese TV that was ruggedized to space standards. Note the Snoopy figure, which was the mascot of the Apollo 10 mission, on which this camera was first to be deployed. In this Apollo 11 picture, you can see that the monitor and the camera have been taped together to allow filming of the LEM interior while attached to the CM. They had to use pretty heady technology for the time to keep it small enough and developed special ICEs mounted on ceramic substrates. The ICUs was a revolutionary first in television and the chips were adapted after the program to commercial TV, yet another contribution of the Apollo program to our daily life. The filter wheel had six color filters and ran at 10 RPM in sync with the 60 Hz NTSC interlaced fields, of which two are needed to make a complete image called a frame. Anyhow, that was enough to get relatively good color in a 2 MHz bandwidth and was quickly adopted in a command module, giving us the pretty views of the spacecraft interior. However, it was originally considered impossible to get color TV from the LEM. Not only did it have the FM bandwidth issue, but there was a bigger showstopper, the antenna. The LEM had a much smaller high gain antenna than the CM. At lunar distances, even the black and white slow scan TV link budget was marginal at best. Luckily, the Apollo program ended up getting help from two giant antennas that were not originally allocated to the program. The Parkes Radio Telescope antenna in Australia and the giant Goldstone antenna in California. Both were 64 meters in diameter, much larger than the 26 meters tracking antennas that were dedicated to the Apollo program. During the historical Apollo 11 landing, the first few minutes of the moonwalk were received by the 26 meter antenna at Honeysuckle. But a few minutes in, they switched to the 64 meter at nearby parks, and you can see an immediate quality increase. Here is the moment of the transition. Right here. And if you pay attention to the audio closely, you can hear that they are announcing the switch to the Parks antenna. Flight network, that's Parks. Roger, Capcom, reminder. Let's do it again and look at the detail on the ladder, for example. You can see a significant difference even though this is a digitally enhanced version of the footage. That's what an extra 10 dB of signal will do for you. And this is what allowed the link budget to close for color TV with the command module of Apollo 10 and 11 in the first place. But even that was still insufficient for the LEM's smaller antenna. However, the engineers calculated that if you equipped the astronauts with a larger foldable antenna that they could deploy on the moon's surface, Color TV would be possible in conjunction with Goldstone or Parks on the ground. And that's exactly what they did for Apollo 12. Here you can see the large deployable high-gain antenna next to the LEM. 
It's pretty big compared to the size of the astronauts. There was still no good solution around the limited bandwidth problem, so they just low-pass filtered the signal out of the camera, limiting it to 700 kHz, considerably reducing the amount of detail. It started all good until Alan Beam relocated the camera on his tripod, as he had been instructed to. But he had artistic inspiration and decided to get a shot with the Earth in the background, which seems like a good composition to me. Except that the sun was within 5 degrees of Earth. Uh-oh! So here it comes, the lucky astronaut comes to grab the camera. The camera is off its upside down mountain location for recording the astronauts down the ladder. Here we go, on its tripod we get a glimpse of the moon, shot gets trained to the face of the earth, and oops, it gets the sun and it's gone. This is how Stan Lebar, the maker of the camera you just saw in the vintage film, recalls the incident. On Apollo 12, yeah. how long did it take for you to recognize that they burned the camera out by swinging around to the sun? Because oh. Walter Cronkite took hours before he reported it. Well, uh, when he, he said Earth, he said there's Earth, and we knew that there was five degrees difference between sun and Earth. Uh, it was a, a, a mark that we got for ourselves to always know where sun and Earth were. Mm -hmm. And five degrees, mm -hmm. we knew, if you're going to look at Earth, you're going to get sun, and you're going to blow it. So the second he said, hey, there's Earth, and it looked like he was swinging towards it, we all jumped up and yelled, no, right right don't away. do that. And we were trying to get to the phone to tell him, don't do it, when it, it just seared. Alan Bean has taken a hell of a hit, and, I, and he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. And then they gave him, instead of a camera, a box with a stick on it as a, simula a simulation. He never even saw it, he never used one. Hmm. So unbeknownst to Bean, the camera did not use a normal Vidigan tube. It was based on a military dark vision tube with a light intensifier. Which is great for achieving enormous dynamic range, but makes the tube incredibly fragile and sensitive to instant burnout if pointed toward the sun. Interestingly, the tube was not completely dead. They brought the camera back and Stan Lebar and his team were able to inspect it. Now that's what it looked like after it got burned up. That's from a monitor. As you can see, there's no <coughs> image. No image here. And this is the part that burned out. Now, it turned out the burn in the target was only down this far. This part of the thing was still pretty solid. And they were trying to get Bean to do something, and they said to him, can you hear, and I don't know why they said that, can you hear the motor going in the car? You can't hear anything in, in, uh, in the back <laughs> So they, they're telling this guy, and he's got this headset on, can you hear them? So he said, no, but I just hit it with a hammer. <laughs> and when he hit it with a hammer, his target right here just folded over like that. So it was bad enough before, but I mean, we got it in the laboratory, it looked like that as we got it back from the And when we took that plate off, uh, there was the plate off and there, you could just, we could have cut any wire, and they cut one of the wires, and then it looked like this. And there it is. Now we have the camera upside down, but there is the image. It was always there. What happened is, the camera has automatic light control, and it sensed a very bright light from the camera. So it just clamped everything down to blackness. And he was bringing it down and it wouldn't let go. And when we cut the wire, we just eliminated and disabled the uh, automatic light control. And the image came back on. The fix for Apollo 13 was simple, adding a rubber cap to place on the camera while it was moved. They also put a black and white slow camera in the LEM as a backup. So here is Apollo 13's camera on the Mesa pallet with its rubber cap added. But of course, this one never made it to the moon. 
And eventually, Color TV from the Moon was successful with Apollo 14. However, the filtering of the signal to 700 kHz made the images a bit soft. Another unforeseen issue was that the white astronaut suits caused severe blooming in the camera due to the extreme sensitivity of the tube and its lack of gamma correction. In the meantime, right after the Apollo 12 mishap, a contract was quickly awarded to RCA to develop a more robust version of the color camera. RCA had designed the slow scan black and white camera that was used inside the command module on Apollo 7 and 8, but not the lunar one which was Westinghouse's. And RCA considered itself the leader of color TV and was immensely annoyed that the first color contract had gone to Westinghouse. But now was their time to shine because they had recently introduced a new tube technology that they called the Ultricon which promise both excellent sensitivity and immunity to blooming and burnout. Not only that, but while they were at it, NASA made the camera robotic and remotely controllable. It was to be mounted on the rover, which just became available for Apollo 15. It was now called the GCTA, or Ground Control Television Assembly. And in a flash of brilliance, JPL communication engineers invented a new active circuitry to eliminate the interference caused by the voice and data signals. They recovered the voice and data using PLL techniques, then remodulated it on top of the carriers, in essence recreating an exact cleaned up copy of the interfering signal. They then reversed its phase and subtracted it from the received signal. This involved a lot of complicated electronics, but worked really well. Now, for the first time, the full TV signal was allowed to stump right over the voice and data carriers, and the full 2 MHz link bandwidth became usable in the LEM. And that gave us the many hours of color footage from the later missions, with Mission Control acting as the film director via the robotic camera. On 16 and 17, yet another processing step was added to remove the snow noise artifacts electronically, which was done on the fly by a young Hollywood startup called Image Transform. They compared consecutive frames and removed dots that appeared randomly between the frames. And all that hard technical work truly paid off when they brought us these priceless snippets of TV lunar action. Go ahead, experiments. Okay, we're about a half minute from where we should leave here. Raj. This is the best way for me to travel, uphill or downhill. What's that? Like this, two-legged hop. Man, I can cover ground like a kangaroo. No way we are going to beat that footage, but we wanted to try out color for ourselves. Sadly, we could not lay our hands on a sequential color camera, so we had to settle with regular NTSC color, which I was pretty sure would not work because of the 6 MHz needed. But we tried it anyhow. So another day, a picture from the moon, but that's because Mike has another shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and the question arose is, um, this is black and white and then they upgraded. Mm -hmm. At least it was slow scan black and white and they upgraded to color. Tube time, you've brought an amazing piece of equipment. Ah, beautiful. This is a Japanese uh, professional broadcast camera from the late 70s. But it uses three tubes instead of one tube. So one for red, one for green, and one for blue. Right. And it produces a regular NTSC color. And actually, we're going to show you what it is. So right now, this is the black and white from our camera. And most of the stuff is below one megahertz. Uh, but why don't we get yours going? And then here we go. So we have color. And very unfortunately, in the regular NTSC, the color is at four something megahertz. Uh, so let's let's hook it up, but I don't have any hopes. We'll probably get a black and white picture, but it won't get any color variation. That's what I'm expecting. Oh, yeah, there's a picture. We got a picture. It's, it's a black and white monitor. We're idiots. <laughs> uh, 
But so we get the black and white information. Actually, it's a much better picture than with the other Vidicon. Yeah. Hello. Uh, is it long enough? Yes. You see something? Yeah, turn the brightness up. We see some, yeah, vaguely, some vaguely... A little bit of color. Yeah, there's some color there. There is? Oh, yeah. I'm gonna try turning up the color. Why wow, you have to use your imagination. There's a lot of noise in there, so you can see color noise, but... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. your shirt is, is turned out sl slightly blue. Oh, we have an itsy bitsy bit of color. Yeah, the earth we just got. Look at that! Yeah, 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 yeah. Look at that. Yeah, there's some red, there's some blue. Yeah. I'll be darned, there is a tiny itsy bitsy bit of color. The lights? Uh, no, on the... Um, well, the lights is fine. It is shooting this over here. Uh, but I would like the... Um, the analog computer if you could because I have it in the background the same frame all right so we have the analog computer on the ground back there and transmission from the moon wow well, darn it I'm very surprised but the quality is of course not very good because right. we're, we're just missing it's just can hardly pull the stuff from the noise mm -hmm. we could try a color bars hey, oh. hey that's pretty good that's wow really good. I am impressed. I did cheat slightly and I turned the chroma knob up on the TV. Oh, well, uh, so normally it would come through like this. Wow, color TV from the moon. I am very, very surprised. So wouldn't you know it, we got some regular color NTSC over the moon link. After we matched our video impedances correctly, it got even better. But really, we cheated. We had very good signal to noise ratio and our modern Sony Trinitron monitor from the late 1990s is chock full of ICs and has one of the best color decoders in the business. I didn't know there were rainbows on the moon, but it's back there. Anyhow, I hope you appreciate the effort that NASA put into getting us color TV from the moon. I saved the best snippet for last, here we go, from the last Apollo moonwalk Apollo 17. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May. May. May is the month. May, that's right. May is the year of the month. When, uh, much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. Do -do 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 -do. 